Before we get into the actual episode, just a couple quick housekeeping items. First, towards the end of the episode, Cody's computer unfortunately died. So the interview ended a bit shorter than we would have liked, which you'll hear at the end. But the first half that was recorded, which you guys hear in this episode, had some awesome nuggets that I wanted to make sure got shared. Cody's team and my team are working on finding a new time to get this episode finished. So if you like this first part, be sure to stay tuned for part two. All right, let's get into this week's episode with Cody Sanchez. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Cody Sanchez. Cody, welcome to the show. Thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. The first thing I want to do is learn a bit about you and your background. Tell us your story and give us a quick rundown on how you got to where you are today. Uh, yeah, I mean, a little 60 seconds about me is I, um, I was a journalist originally. I started off as a human trafficking and um, drug smuggling focused journalist right out of college, graduated a little bit early um, and focused on my thesis of basically what happens along the U.S.-Mexico border and when, when borders separate humans. And so I wrote some uh, what I thought were interesting stories about um you know, people being left behind and uh, families being separated. And I continued doing that for a few years. But at at one point, I just sort of realized, man, I don't want to just be telling the story. I want to be trying to make some changes in the story. And I knew that journalism wasn't the right place to do that. You needed to actually factually report the news and keep your opinion and biases out of it. At least that's what it was supposed to be like back in my day. And, um, and then, so, so I thought, well, how do you make the most impact? And in my opinion, uh, it was, you know, not status. It wasn't if you were American or Mexican, the differentiator between those who live incredible lives and those who live harder lives is monetary. It's, you know, one word, uh, money and, and this, you know, green language that everybody speaks, um, is really what controls, uh, most happiness in life, at least up to a certain level is if you cannot cover your basic human needs, then really nothing else uh, like personal passions or pursuits matters. And so I got kind of obsessed with financial freedom. And what does that mean? And how do you get it? I started at a young age. And I, and I realized, I don't know anything about money. You know, I'm a journalist. Like We didn't make any money. I didn't know what a 401k was. I didn't know about mutual funds. And so I kind of worked my way through a bunch of financial institutions, uh, got, got lucky, got into a program at Vanguard, which was an accelerated development program where you got to see a bunch of different aspect, aspects of the firm. And then went to you know uh, Goldman Sachs, and then State Street, uh, and then finally ended up running a business at First Trust that was a Latin American investment business. So built that business up to a pretty good size, Uh, exited that business, was looking for my next emerging market, went into cannabis private equity, saw an opportunity there between the difference between the narrative on cannabis and the actual numbers and thought we could profit handsomely while actually doing some good like we did in Latin America. And so built up a, a large asset management business in cannabis. And, um, and then we did three funds together. And after that third fund, I thought, okay, I think we've made our mark in this space. I have a decent allocation to it. Like what's the next asset class? And, uh, and that's when I started um, talking publicly about investing in small businesses or what I call boring businesses with an eye towards private equity or later stage companies that have been around for a long time, but cash flow. And so right now I probably talk about that the most publicly, um, but the real goal is financial freedom. And these asset classes are all just a tool that you can use to get it. Do you think that saying that money can't buy happiness is wrong? Yeah, I do. I think it's absolutely wrong. I think we've actually proven that the statistics, and you can go and look at the research on this, where it says like anything over $70,000 has a de minimis impact on happiness increase is actually false. The data was flawed. And um, it actually shows that happiness does increase all the way up to, I can't remember if it's about $500,000 a minimum uh, or a million dollars, but then, you know, it starts to plateau and then you have little increases from like a million to 10 million and 10 million to 50 million, whatever the case may be. But um, there is no doubt that somebody is trying to sell you something if they say that money doesn't matter. In this world that we live in today, money absolutely matters. And you want to make sure that you can cover at least your base needs and then have incremental growth in it. I mean, that's why we have minimum wage to start, uh, but you're not supposed to stay there. You're supposed to continue to climb up to different wage levels because uh, it does actually increase happiness at a certain degree. Now, do I think that if you have money, you are happy? No, that's a totally different thing. 
does not mean that you are happy just because you're wealthy in any way, shape or form. Um, but it does help if you have money. And so I think we need to be honest about that. Uh, and then people might feel better about the pursuit of it. I completely 100% agree. That has always been my philosophy. And and I think the distinction you made is so important because just because you have money doesn't mean you're going to be happy, but having money can help you get happy is kind of the way I think about it. And I also think like anything that you want to do that will make you happy is likely going to take money. So whether you care about money or not, like that's fine. If you don't, you know, if you don't care about being rich or making money, that's fine. But whatever you want to do that you do care about takes money. And so I think people need to really connect those two to really understand that, you know, having money can help buy happiness. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you have like different polarities, right? You have the Mr. Money Mustache guy, which is like, I want to retire early or the fire guy that wants to retire early and they want, you know, they don't really care about making additional money on top of it. They keep their income level at the same consistently over time. And then people would say, well, they're happier than Peter Thiel, who, you know, is a billionaire and simultaneously, you know, maybe isn't married or doesn't have family or, you know, whatever the case may be. But, um, but I think the difference is like this guy has just realized what is the monetary level that is interesting and ha- and increases happiness for him. And maybe some billionaires haven't. And so they keep pursuing past their rate of need. And so you kind of got to figure out what that is for you. All the time I say, like, I don't want to be a Fortune 500 CEO. If you paid me right now, I mean, well, if you paid me $100 million, I'd do it for one year and then I'd quit. But I wouldn't keep doing that job, right? Um, I'm actually very happy and I've chosen continuously over my career less money in the moment for more personal freedom uh, and to do things that I want to do or find interesting or have actual impact. Um, And so I think that's the balance. People think about it unilaterally when it's a tripod. It's like, where can you have freedom? Where can you have you know, whatever you think you're good at or your purpose is, and then where can you be monetarily rewarded for it? When I was graduating high school, my superlative, you know, those things, they, they vote you, you know, best smile, best eyes, whatever. I was voted most likely to be a billionaire because I just, I've always loved money. I've always wanted to be wealthy. And like, I just used to want to be super rich. And over the last couple of years, I've had that same realization that you had is like, I don't actually want to be a billionaire. Like, I don't want to be a fortune 500 CEO. Like you said, I want more time than I do anything. And over the last year or so, I actually took a a relatively decent pay cut to step back from my corporate career to just do the podcast full time and do real estate because so much more flexibility and so much more, you know, I could do what I want versus, you know, making a little bit extra money that wasn't worth it to me. Yep. I totally agree. I think most of it comes down to how well do you know yourself? You know, it's what the Oracle of Delphi said, right? It's know thyself. And so once you give yourself some space to be the architect of your own home, as opposed to buying somebody else's, uh, then you kind of can figure out what money means to you. But most people don't spend that much time thinking about money or wealth, except, you know, in the next step forward. So, you know, my framework on wealth and money is longer term. It's how do I want my life to look day to day, week to week, year to year, and three and five and 10 years out. And then I want to reverse engineer that. So what do I have to do to have a day or a week or a month in which I'm never cleaning the house, in which I can live in two locations, you know, in which I get to donate to whatever charity I want to at any moment in time without having to think about it. And then I reverse engineer the money to that because I think about what do I want? And money. if money is just a tool, I don't think, hey, I want 50,000 hammers because I might have a nail I want to hammer. I think, hey, I'm going to have a pretty big construction project. It'd be great if I had a whole construction crew to do it with a lot of hammers that they all use. And that's why I want the money. And so I think people need to reframe themselves slightly. I reverse engineered and kind of backed into mine as well. I had somebody sit me down once because I was kind of on that endless treadmill of just wanting more and more and more. And I had somebody sit me down once they were very successful and they said, write down everything you could ever imagine you want in life and then calculate how much that costs. And I did that and it was way less than I expected. Like it was significantly less than I expected. So I was like, (laughs) okay, maybe I don't have to, you know, go all out for every single dollar ever just to get all the stuff I want. And that was, you know, like you said, it's knowing yourself. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Where did your curiosity for becoming a contrarian come from? Do you think it is rooted in your background as a journalist? I feel like a lot of journalists might be, you know, especially in a, in a field maybe where you were, could be contrarian. Yeah, well, I think... Um, 
a few different things. From a young age, I've certainly pushed against norms to my parents' probably chagrin. But um, but more than anything, I think it came from reading. You know, if, if I could impress upon people to do one thing in their lives, it would be to read more. Um, that's why I started a newsletter, Contrary and Thinking. That's why I sort of push people to there. Because when you consume content um, through TV or video or whatever the case may be, it's really hard for you to pause and like add stuff, ponder it, think about it. Reading is one of the few mediums in my perspective where you can, you know, you can have a book in front of you. And in that very moment, you just pause, write a little something, you know, and when you're listening to a podcast, you might have to pause the podcast TV show and otherwise is the same. And so for me, I think it came from a young age, I would read ravenously. And some of my favorite books, if people want to stimulate that cantankerous thought inside of them are like letters to a young contrarian from uh, Christopher Hitchens. And he talks about how to uh, stand up against whatever the mob may be. And it, what's interesting to me today is that people think about critical thinking and contrarian thinking and questioning things as sort of some sort of political leaning, right? Like it seems to be a mantra of the right right now. But, you know, uh, Christopher Hitchens, he was a communist. He was like a, you know, card carrying member of the Communist Party in the US. And he said the same thing. He's like, it was just all about questioning things and coming to solutions yourself. And so I think that is why that's ingrained in me is are all of those those questions that i saw protagonists ask continuously and uh they lend themselves to having a cantankerous mind these days do you think it has to be books you know i think over the last couple decades books were kind of the default but with there's mm -hmm. newsletters like yours that are amazing and i mean there's tons of them right and you know, maybe we can get as much value from newsletters as we could potentially book. So do you think it has to be books or can it just be reading in general? I think long form thoughts tend to lead to uh, long form payouts. So, you know, in, in my belief, if you are reading long form, and that's typically in the form of books, it could be, I suppose, a series of newsletters, for sure. Um, it allows you to get really deep into a subject matter that you can steal somebody else's 10,000 hours as opposed to having to do them yourselves. And so um, part of me says, yes, I still think that books are the medium today. Now, newsletters are great, but even my 10,000 word newsletter or 3,000 word newsletter or whatever it is, um, it's not going to give you as much context as as if you immerse yourself in the pages of, you know, the biography of Winston Churchill, which I think is a great uh, book from uh, somebody wanting to learn from history. So yeah, and, and people disagree with me. I mean, we're getting faster and faster and faster on this. I mean, TikTok has, you know, more eyeballs than Facebook. And certainly, you know, email is not set for long form platforms. But I think if you want to differentiate yourself, well, you shouldn't think about what is most of the crowd doing. In fact, you should probably question if most of the crowd is doing something and say instead, what do I think has the best return on my time? Where's my ROI spend? And if I have to think about it, when you can focus intently on one thing, that's usually your highest ROI spend as opposed to when you're really scattered, like you would be reading email, reading newsletters, having other things that can pop up and invade your psyche. So I think it is absolutely books, even though nobody really does that. I host two podcasts. One is about real estate and one is more about stock investing and side hustles. Mm -hmm. Today, we're not talking on the real estate one, but I still want to talk about something that is real estate related because I read it in one of your newsletters and it piqued my interest. And you wrote, why buying rental properties is dot, 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 dumb. Talk to us about this newsletter that you wrote and why you think rental properties might be a dumb idea. So um, it's all about opportunity cost, right? So in everything in life, if you want to go out on a Friday night with your friends, you can't stand and watch the Netflix movie. If you want to go to a concert, you can't go out and go to a dinner. You have to pick, right? And for every decision you make, there's some constraint, which means you don't get to do something else. And with investing, and when you have money, you have to think about where can my little soldiers, where can my little army of soldiers go best and attack the one reason that I have them out there fighting anyway, and that's for more money to come back to me, right? I want my soldiers to go out. I want them to get more soldiers and I want them to bring them back to me. And so when it comes to rental property investing, the market right now is really tough. You know, uh, Real estate's at all-time highs. Interest rates are very low, which means we continue to have more and more people purchase. Um, even though rental uh, prices have gone up, it's really hard for you to buy a property that makes you enough money to cover your mortgage costs and all the additional, let's call it utilities and whatever else. They say that the average rental property makes something like, I'm gonna mess this up, 400 to $600 um, a month 
is the average payout for a rental property. And so if you think about that, the average cost of a home in the US is anywhere from $200,000 to $300,000. I would imagine that's gone up slightly over the last couple of years. Um, then you are putting down a pretty big pay- down payment to get a couple of hundred dollars a month paid into your bank account. So what I would be saying if I was those soldiers, I'm like, well, you're not bringing back many others with a rental property. Instead, I want something where I got a better return on your time. And so I, I own rental properties properties. I you know, think you should have them diversified, but I'm much more interested in buying cash flow in businesses. I'm interested in short-term rentals because those have a higher return than long-term rentals do. I'm interested in how can I get into maximizing renting on other liabilities that I have and turning them into assets, you know, cars, bikes, surfboards, whatever the case may be. Um, and I'm interested in things where I have to do less work and put up less capital to have a bigger return on my time. So, um, the last point I'll just say is like, anytime it's really easy for someone to execute on an idea, you usually have a decreased return. So right now we have a lot of people out there buying real estate, doing rental properties. And, you know, when you have a rental property, there's only so much you can do to differentiate yourself. And, uh, and you know, it's not usually service. You can't add other experiences on top of it. You kind of have like one revenue stream you can get from it. And so those aren't my favorite type of businesses. I would even prefer an Airbnb to a, to a long-term rental because an Airbnb, you can have better services. You can have tied experiences. You can have really cool decorations in the business overall. You could have um, like incredible location. You could do events there. There's lots of different things things you could do. Whereas with a rental property, you can't do as much. Does the increased risk of Airbnb concern you over rental properties? You know, lots of people talk about that. And I think, yes, I wouldn't underwrite it to the, you know, um, underwrite it, meaning I wouldn't expect that long-term I can make the same amount of money uh, forever that I'm making today. Um, I typically don't expect that in any business, but you know, if I have a pretty high cash on cash return and I'm buying the property at a level where I would be okay with long-term rentals, but I happen to be doing short-term rentals, then I think it's a really interesting model. Um, and then, you know, you can always long-term rental it. You can always, you know, if you have enough, uh, capital, make sure that you, you know, can weather a storm if there's a pullback in that market. Um, but at this point, you know, I, I'd be hard pressed to imagine that Airbnb goes away forever. That would that would have to be a, a pretty aggressive move. And in this world where more and more cities and states are deciding that, you know, they're going to some are deciding to limit freedoms immensely, and some are deciding to open a freedoms immensely. I think you know, m- my goal would be to choose more properties in freedom based markets. I'm getting into the Airbnb space. I have more rental properties and I don't have any, any short-term rentals, but I'm starting to get into Airbnbs and we're going to talk about RVs a little bit later. But what concerns me about Airbnbs is just if legislation changes. So I want to buy one in Florida, but a friend, yeah. a good friend of mine lives in Virginia beach. And I was talking to him about potentially looking at one there and they just out like not outlawed it, but like they made it very difficult. They just changed a bunch of laws in Virginia beach that basically said, um, you, you can't do it there. And there's some ways around it, but it just made it really, really difficult. And so things like that kind of concern me with Airbnb uh, overall. Yeah, I, I think you always have to underwrite for legislative risk, for sure. Um, but that's where the opportunity comes in too. So you need to decide between the two, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I originally found you on Twitter because one of your tweet threads went a little bit viral and came across my my feed. And this was about your deal that nets. $67,000 with only $100,000 needed to close. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this was a laundromat, one of the first deals uh, that we did in that space. And um, basically, so I talked to a lot of people about how to buy boring businesses, how you don't have to be a rocket scientist or Elon Musk to go out and create cash flow and create a really incredible life for yourself. And then and then once you're stable and once you have enough cash flow for you, build from a place of abundance as opposed to scarcity. Build the SpaceX next, but do it from a place where you're not, you know, sacrificing your entire, you know, future or your mortgage in order to build this huge next thing. So with the laundromats, um, 
there's a whole entire market of baby boomers who are retiring right now. There's millions of businesses. We, we estimate anywhere from 1.2 to 2.5 million businesses for sale in the U.S. right now that are considered SMBs, small and medium businesses. These are businesses that are predominantly boring businesses, businesses like laundromats, car washes, anything you can think of, podcast services companies. I own one of those. It's called Strike Fire Productions. Um, carpet cleaning, house cleaning, all of these things that we take for granted every day are these small and medium businesses that I like to go and buy. And so in this instance, it's a laundromat. It's a very simplistic business where um, I bought that business for $100,000 for the machines and the uh, rights to the business and to operate it and the SOPs and all of that. And it didn't include the building. Uh, It was a leased uh, property and it cash flows, you know, now it's anywhere from let's call it 67,000 to 75, $80,000 a year. And that's net. And then people typically, especially real estate people are like, liar, no way, no way that happens. And the funny part about that is it happens every day in, in SMB land. If you don't believe me, you can go to biz buy sell. I'm not a part of them. And you can look at their annual report and on it, you can see that businesses typically are sold anywhere from one to three X in the SMB space. So from one times their annual process uh, profits to three times their annual profits. And, you know, there's definitely some, some, Uh, pushing up in costs right now because we're in such a long bull market. But um, those businesses are for sale everywhere. So I happen to buy this one. What is the difference when you buy a business like this between buying something that's more passive and just buying another job? Like how did you buy this laundromat and not just buy yourself a job? Well, in, I think in any business, um, if you're going to buy a house and do rental properties, right? Or rents on it for your first rental property, you're going to do some work. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. Expect the first deal you you do, you're going to have to be involved in some way. You're going to, first of all, have to find the deal. Then you're going to have to structure the deal. Then you're going to have to finance the deal. Then you're going to have to figure out how to operate it. In the case of a rental property, you might have a property manager, or you might just, you know, have a little bit better automation besides getting phone calls in the middle of the night when something goes wrong, or, um, you know, having to find a new renter when your person leaves or steals money or whatever the case is. Um, Buying a business, is not very different. So in this laundromat example, pretty much all of my businesses, except maybe three or four, I have an operator that runs them. So in real estate, it's not that weird for you to have a property manager, right? You would think that's pretty normal to do if you had multiple properties. Um, When you buy a business, you can do the same thing. You can have a general manager would be probably appropriate for a laundromat, somebody that oversees the business overall at a managerial standpoint, or you can have an operator, somebody who is like your CEO of your laundromat business that runs multiple of them. And so if you know how to build a business, it's not that different than buying a business and then layering management on top of it. What were you looking for in the laundromat? What what made it attractive for you? How do you even run the numbers on you know underwriting that? How do you know how many people are going to go in there and clean their clothes and how much they're spending and all of that? I mean, maybe you could look at historical financials if that owner even kept good records. I know a lot of times mom and pop owners don't do that. And then mm-hmm. demographics, like what is the area like where you bought it? How important is that? Well, um, so I think just like buying real estate, all of that is important. Um, I like to look at a couple different things. So if I'm buying a laundromat, I want them to have three to five years of uh, P&Ls. I want them to have three to five years of tax returns. Tax returns are obviously more reliable than their financial statements or their P&Ls because you actually know that they're not going to pay the government more than they have to for their laundromat over multiple years. Like that's not going to happen. So that's your baseline. Then typically there's going to be some wiggle room between what they reported to the government and the P&Ls that they're trying to show you, right, on the business, especially in this year. And so that's where you start to get to negotiate. And if you're trying to get a who evaluation, there's a couple different ways to do it. First of all, we really only care about cash flow, right? So we want to figure out how much money they made every single year, which means we need two inputs, right? We need how many quarters they collected, or if they're on you know, technology, you can do it that way. And then we also need how much they spent. And so um, it's kind of like you become a little detective. You are going into this business and sort of trying to figure out, okay, do all the expenses make sense? Can I look at the utilities bills for the location? Can I, can I have an equipment provider tell me what all the the machines are worth inside of it. They'll usually do that for free. Kind of like you would have somebody come and uh, check your house 
and inspect it right before you bought a property. Same thing with like the equipment on the on the laundromat. And then you'd want to make sure that the lease has at least 10 years on the lease term for a laundromat. You need a longer lease term because the two most expensive things in a laundromat are your rent and your utilities, mostly your water and electricity. And so, you know, those are the things I'm starting to analyze and it becomes a little bit of a game. The cool part about this is it's not rocket science. It is really straightforward. You're just a sleuth tracking down where did the money go? Where did it come from? And do I believe the numbers that I'm getting told? How did you finance this deal? Uh, I didn't finance that one. So that deal, I ended up actually paying for cash uh, on the deal. Um, and But I've done seller financing on deals. So there's like four different ways, right? So the first way is seller financing, which means that the owner will pay you out of future sales to purchase the business. Um, we've done that in a ton of deals. So uh, 60% of small businesses are sold with seller financing, very different numbers than in real estate. It's super normal. Uh, the second way on laundromats is equipment loans. So there's a bunch of them like Coinomatic. Um, oh, I'm blanking on some of the other names, but there's a bunch of providers that will actually give you a loan based on the hard assets, the equipment that you have in the laundromat. And they'll do that at a decreased rate from like a hard money lender, which would be more like, you know, double digits if you were going to do that. And then the third way is um, getting an SBA loan. So getting the actual SBA to come out and um, they will do anywhere up to 90% of the purchase price. Laundromats are a little hard with the SBA if they don't have clean financials. You can't always get an SBA loan on it. Um, and then the last way, and you know, it just depends on, on how you want to do the deal, um, is you can get lines of credit from banks or you can get direct bank loans on businesses like commercial lending. Um, so those are kind of the different ways you can structure deals. We've pretty much done all of them, except I've never done hard money lending. Um, and I've... I don't think I've ever done an equipment loan on a laundromat straight up, uh, although we've taken loans on laundromat equipment before. If you do SBA, do they still require 20%, 30% down, some sort of large down payment on the purchase price? Usually it's 10%, um, 10 to 20%. The, the interesting thing about the SBA is if you want to figure out how to get an SBA loan or free government money, which it basically is, it's a grant program, you search um, you know, most frequently but something along the search terms of like um, most commonly used SBA loans, uh, SBA, SBA loan banks. And for those, you'll see a list. It'll be like the top hundred banks by number of SBA loans that they've processed. And so you can basically go down the list. And the thing with the SBA is it's run through normal banking institutions. So there are the SBA rules and then there's the bank's rules. So I like to use a, a uh, a uh, broker, typically, if I'm new to this business, somebody like multifunding, who would help you find who would be the best bank to do your type of deal. And they'll actually reach out to a bunch of banks with you. You'll find out what the rates are. You'll They'll talk to the guys and let them know how real do they think it is that they'll be able to fund your deal. Um, and those things are pretty important. Um, and then the other thing to note with an SBA is you can't layer loans on it. So like if you get an SBA loan, you can't then go also add an equipment loan on top of it. SBA has to be in the first lien position. That means they have the first right to your money. You have a quote that I love personally, but some people might find it controversial. And you said, the world is the classroom and the school is the prison. Talk to us a bit more about this quote. You get a new view. Uh, so the world is, well, so basically what I'm trying to say here is this. Um, I think that the way that we have the educational system set up right now does not actually create producers or creators. It creates the opposite of independent thinkers. And I can say this because I went to Georgetown for my MBA and I went to a public school, Arizona State, for my undergrad. I got a PhD in Brazil and um, from Fundação de Estúdio Vargas, which is like their most preeminent institution. I mean, it also involved a lot of like dancing in the streets and cachaça. So like take it with a grain of salt. But um but I've been to a lot of these institutions and I can tell you firsthand, people say, well, you go to the Ivy leagues to get the network and Georgetown isn't an Ivy league, but it's a pretty good school. And Hey, I have a bunch of buds from Georgetown, but it's not my network. That is by and far not the um, number way that I've created a network. It's actually through things like this and on the internet. And the other thing about it is, you know, these days, I think institutions are really good at teaching you what to think and not how to think. 
And unfortunately, that's what we're paying our dollars to do, as opposed to going out and actually doing the thing and then going to school to think about mental frameworks. You know, think about how many people we follow on Twitter to think about mental frameworks on how to consider things. And then think about how often you went to school and you were just reciting history and repeating items as opposed to actually learning from them. So I have a big problem with how the educational system is set up right now. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.